everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name's Una, and for the next half hour we'll be talking about Gabriella's riveting book, um, Hacker, Hoaxer, Rooster, Blow, Spy, I always get them uh, mixed up in the wrong order, and The Many Faces of Anonymous. I think to kick off, I'd like to draw your attention, if you haven't bought a book already, if you don't have it, to this amazing design on the first um, couple of pages. And there's a piece, it's, you know, this kind of maze um, with some quirkiness to it. And there's a quote in the in the book that really struck me in terms of explaining the structure of Anonymous or the lack thereof or how complex it is. Um, Anonymous was not simply a maze with a structure and escape route um, revealed in a view from above. Anonymous was a far more complicated and tangled warren. And so I'd like to, to start by asking you, Gabrielle, in terms of the beginnings, really, that crash course on how this maze became a labyrinth within a labyrinth um, that is quite difficult really to define and to explain. So, um, hi everyone, thanks for coming out on uh, Guy Fox Day as well. Woo! Um, <laughs> no, it's Guy Fox Day. Exactly. So, I mean, there are many kind of beginnings to Anonymous, and I guess that's what makes it really interesting, is that um, Anonymous as a name has been reinvented multiple times. And for those that may not know, uh, the kind of name was originally used um, for uh, organizing internet uh, trolling campaigns, which are kind of fearsome forms of pranking. And it was a name that was often associated with the image board uh, 4chan. And in 2008, uh, there was a kind of dramatic metamorphosis where the name started to be used for activism. And it was in part due to Tom Cruise and the Church of Scientology, where there was a very famous video that had been leaked on the internet by a Scientologist and ex Scientologist of Tom Cruise, who was vigorously uh, praising the Church of Scientology and the church wanted everything, um, they wanted to do everything possible to make that video go away. And uh, Anonymous was known as the internet hate machine back in that day, and they kind of uh, organized what I often think of as their mothership trolling campaign against the Church of Scientology because they were upset that this video was being censored. And um, what was very interesting was at this point, due to kind of various factors that I explore in the book, they decided to kind of earnestly uh, protest the Church of Scientology. Mm -hmm. And this was in uh, January, February of 2008. And then, alas, the name gets, you know, used for both activism and trolling. And at this time, it was actually relatively straightforward. It was really only in 2010 where you started to get even more of a complex geography than you even had at that time. And um, where did your interest um, start with, with Anonymous. How did you decide that this is something you were going to spend six years hanging out with? So it has uh, to do with the fact that I ended up at uh, the University of Alberta as a postdoctoral fellow for one year because there's the largest Scientology archives in the world there, um, which I didn't go there because there was the Scientology archives. I went there for something else, but once I found out, how can you resist, you know, Scientology material, right? <laughs> So I dove in, and the reason why I dove in was in the 1990s, um, many geeks and hackers had protested the Church of Scientology uh, because they had um, contributed to leaking secret church documents, um, and many of them were leaked on a message board, uh, Usenet, and uh, the Church of Scientology went completely berserk and kind of uh, went after all its critics, including geeks and hackers, and a lot of the early battles over copyright and trademark on the internet and anonymity had to do with battles between geeks and hackers. And so when I was at the University of Alberta, you know, the winters are incredibly long and cold. They start in October, um, they finish in May. I figured I should spend my time indoors in these archives and do a historical project on these 1990s battles. And there was one thing that really fascinated me about it. wasn't It wasn't simply the fact that these kind of two groups were in battle. Is that it was more that these two entities, Scientology and hackers, um, were completely uh, uh, opposed in the sense that they were almost um, mirror images of each other, uh, but kind of inverted. So 
you know, Scientology is in religion of uh, science and technology, but the technology doesn't work. The science is science fiction. You know, hackers are really committed to science and workable technology. So I kind of had this cultural argument that um, geeks and hackers really found deep pleasure in protesting the church Scientology. But I was incredibly secretive uh, because I was afraid of Scientology because they went after its critics and journalists and academics. And in 2008, when this thing by the name of Anonymous came into being to troll the church and then protest, I thought this was a natural extension of that earlier project. And so that's when I started researching them, but I never thought that Anonymous would be anything but a kind of very quirky, interesting, but not really geopolitically significant uh, political movement. But I was completely wrong, obviously. And how did you go about finding stuff out about Anonymous, contacting people, getting to know what they were doing? So the kind of group or project that protested the Church of Scientology, Project Chinology, they were pretty easy to interact with because they um, did and still do engage in monthly, monthly protests against the Church of Scientology in cities, you know, here in Dublin, New York, Boston, D.C., Hamburg, right? So in New York, I got to know a lot of these Chinology Anonymous guys, and I would hang out with them. And it was so great, because then I started to give talks about Anonymous, which were very funny, because the world of Anonymous comes, you know, is derived from a kind of very humor-filled world. Um, and I could also end the reign of secrecy. I could be public about uh, my project on Scientology, because Anonymous helped to really put that to an end. Um, but in 2010, a new network came into being, and it was different from Chinology. And this network was interesting because they really embraced digital direct action, which included hacking and also distributed denial of service attacks, which is when you overwhelm a server with too many requests. And, and they, because they were engaged in illegal activity that was almost purely online, this posed significant kind of issues when I started to research them, right? Uh, there was a lot more secrecy, there was a lot more paranoia, there was trust issues. I was mostly um, interacting with people on internet relay chat, online. Um, and a couple of things helped. First of all, many of these people who were involved in this network had seen my videos. And so they can kind of get a sense that I was at least semi-sympathetic to the world. And then, like many anthropologists before me, I was put to work, right? So I was on these chat channels. <laughs> And a lot of journalists had huge difficulties in finding Anonymous because they're on internet relay chat, which really isn't a sophisticated program, and it's pretty easy to find and use, but if you've never used it, it seems extremely daunting, right? So I trained over 150 journalists uh, to find Anonymous. Um, and so by being put to work, uh, by giving these talks, by doing a lot of media interviews, I eventually gained the trust of a lot of individuals. In terms of accessing them, you're mentioning their um, journalists and journalism, I suppose, interacting with Anonymous. There's been a huge um, misrepresentation of Anonymous, misunderstanding um, of, of various actions and intent and politics and that kind of stuff. Yet Anonymous don't make it easy for themselves either, um, I think it would be fair to say. What do you think, how could you kind of characterize those difficulties in communication that is often crude or offensive, or and, and how media find it very difficult to actually really grasp it, and either became, you know, this is completely evil, or we just don't understand this, it's a bunch of jokers. Right. So, I mean, absolutely, there's, you know, many contradictions to Anonymous, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why I, I like them, and in some ways you're never going to fully resolve them. But one of them is, like, Anonymous is an entity that craves media attention, and it's really incredible, like, how much media that they got, you know, over the last number of years. And, you know, the reasons why they got it spans from the fact that, you know, when the, you hack the heck out of a bunch of companies, well, you know, people are going to report on it, right? And that's, you know, one of the reasons. But Anonymous was also quite savvy in many ways, and they would kind of literally reach out to journalists, too, or write them press uh, releases and notes. So, for example, when they got involved in Tunisia and the Arab Spring, there was a great letter that they wrote to journalists sort of saying, you know, you're not really doing your job right now. There's these protests going on in Tunisia. Uh, please do your job and we'll help you. We've got videos from on the ground, right? On the other hand, you know, they would sometimes uh, troll journalists uh, 
you know, quite ruthlessly. Even, you know, the activist uh, nodes of Anonymous, right? So they would prank them, they would make fun of them. Um, they would also um, get extremely mad when, you know, they felt the misrep misrepresentations or when the representations were off, right? Um, and so they often made uh, the job quite difficult as well. And an added difficulty too, and this was really interesting, was there was a reporter channel on the chat rooms, and it was specifically for reporters to come along. And many reporters did not like to be talking in a group situation and a public situation with people because they felt like they were gonna be scooped, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. They wanted to do a kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation. And there were one-on-one -on -one conversations, but they kind of pressed journalists to engage in that group setting. And some of them were fine with it. And in fact, there were certain journalists from Forbes and other security um, publications who were just on these chat channels always, right? And once you develop these close relationships, they were able to kind of do one-on-one -on -one interviews. But other journalists just refused to, you know, either ever get on IRC and also um, engage in, in group public conversations because that kind of goes against everything that journalists are supposed to do. Um, how would you, in terms of people, like the language used, the, the kind of operations done and so on, and knowing kind of the breadth of knowledge that you, you have on this, how would you typify the if you can, the politics of Anonymous. I mean, is it a kind of hyper-libertarianism? Is it a natural continuation of the 90s anti-capitalist things? Is it just a trickster thing? So that's, you know, one of the things that is so enticing and frustrating about Anonymous. It, you really can't um, put it under the banner of a very specific political philosophy. So certain individuals were certainly part of the late 1990s, early 2000s, anti-globalization, um, anti-capitalist movements, right? Individuals like Jeremy Hammond, who's a hacker who was arrested and is now uh, in jail for 10 years, is part of that tradition. There are other hackers who are libertarian. There's others who just don't necessarily have an offline political philosophy, but came of age politically through anonymous. Um, there's others who are social democrats, communists, you know, just kind of everything under the sun. And that's something very typical to among, in, in different types of hacker projects, there's many kind of open source projects where people who participate have very different offline political sensibilities and they can work together just fine. You don't have to show up and be a card carrying member of the communist party, the hacker communist party to participate. Nevertheless, you know, Anonymous, you know, likes to say that we have like absolutely no ideology, right? And that is a kind of ideology as well. But they also, you know, like many geeks and hackers, really care about a certain set of core issues. And um, these are the hate censorship, they're pro-privacy, you know, things related to um, internet freedom tend to perk them up, right? And these are often sometimes tagged as libertarian, which I think is not quite the case. They're compatible with libertarianism, but they're civil liberties. And civil liberties are issues that you know people both on the left and the right care about. So again, there's a kind of amorphousness uh, when it comes to a general political ideology with the exception of this commitment to civil liberties. And then individually you get everything under the sun from a kind of liberal to left spectrum. Mm. Dublin plays a, a fair part in the book. It pops up um, now and again. What have been your interactions with the city in, in the context of Anonymous? So there's uh, a curious thing where a lot of people in Anonymous, especially hackers, uh, are from the UK and Ireland for some reason. I think a disproportionate number, and that's kind of interesting. And of course, people think, well, it must be the weather. Um, you know, that's probably a decent explanation. But there's probably something else going on, right? And um, so I've actually tended to kind of return to London and Dublin quite a bit uh, for my research because one of the things is, you know, as people got arrested, I started to meet them after jail, in jail. I went to trials. And um, there's two kind of Irish hackers, um, uh, Donico Carroll and Darren Martin, who were part of both Anonymous and they were part of a group called Lulsec, which was an offshoot of Anonymous, and they went on a 50-day hacking spree. 
and um, mm -hmm. they clear, they really had a lot of fun uh, doing it. I, I, last year when I met you, you were just out of the trial or the, the, the court hearing of the two Irish law sex slash anonymous. Exactly. So the two Irish hackers um, were tried here for one hack um, when they hacked the, the Fine Gael website and defaced <laughs> it. Um, they also kind of signed the website with their um, handles, which was probably not the smartest thing in the world to do. <laughs> um, but it was really like fantastic because I went to the trial and um, it was the first hacking trial in Ireland. And what was so amazing about it was, first of all, it was sandwiched in between a bunch of other extremely petty, petty crimes, like stealing alcohol from the corner shop or a drunk, you know, young lady beating up the Garda. And so in between all these cases were like the two hacking cases. And certainly they kind of stood out, right? Like the, you know, the room kind of changed and the, and the, and the deliberation took a little bit longer. But what was amazing was that their punishment was quite light um, and fair in a lot of ways. Because the judge, um, who was a matronly, uh, kind Irish woman, you know, she did not think what Donica and Darren had done was political, even though Darren and Donica did think what they were doing was political. So she didn't recognize it as a kind of activism. Nevertheless, she also was like, recognized that there was no damage because it was a website defacement. Uh, some, I believe some data was stolen but never um, released. And she even questioned um, the prosecution who were claiming that it cost $10,000 to restore the website. And the judge was like, why does it cost so much money? Don't you have a backup, right? <laughs> <laughs> so she was you know, incredibly sensible. And um, you know, Donica and Darren pled guilty and they were each fined $5,000, and most of that money actually went to charity, not even to the Fine Gael website, or the Fine Gael <laughs> political party. And again, what's really remarkable is that both the UK and Ireland, the sentencing was much, much lighter than what you have in the United States, where basically if you get caught for hacking, um, you know, you'll spend at least two years at minimum in jail and then you're often saddled with a fine that's about $200,000, $300,000 or more. So it's a quite a, a big difference. Your life isn't basically ruined on this side of the Atlantic if you engage in this sort of hacking. I'll go back to some of the, <clears throat> the kind of the outcomes of, of criminal trials in a, in a little bit, but obviously they're a consequence of things going slightly awry, things going wrong. At what point did Anonymous go from this fun media curiosity to all of a sudden a uh, political crackdown really right so there was i think a really a couple of pivotal moments and i'll talk about two of them um and one was particularly important as well and it's is really um documented in the book so when this new um network and on ops came into being in september 2010 their their reason for being was to support uh file sharing piracy Right. This is what they were all about. And then in December 2010, you know, WikiLeaks was really in the news and people were quite concerned when um, financial organizations like PayPal and MasterCard pulled the plug for um, providing services to WikiLeaks based on kind of soft pressure by the U.S. government. Well, the Internet got who, who remembers that, you know, yeah. right? And like people were pissed, understandably. You know, this was really preemptive. WikiLeaks had not been found guilty of anything. It hadn't even been charged of anything, right? Um, and so the internet was angry. It was really angry. And Anonymous, who had been DDoSing, you know, copyright associations, had the idea that they should perhaps support WikiLeaks by mirroring WikiLeaks as much of the internet was doing. And then someone went ahead and just DDoSed PayPal as a side project. <laughs> You know, like, why not? Screw them, PayPal. And then someone within uh, this group said, hey, I'm going to claim this as a big anonymous action. And he actually upset everyone else because it wasn't decided by consensus. Um, but then this person convinced the rest of the crew that this may be a good idea and let's jump on the ship because it's sailing, he said. <laughs> and then they announced it. And holy Moses, um, you know, the mothership um, kind of 
digital direction action campaign came into being because over 7,000 people showed up on this one chat channel. You know, tens of thousands of people were downloading the tool that you would use to DDoS PayPal and MasterCard. And then all of a sudden, Anonymous went from a kind of quirky, esoteric thing that was known in the tech community to something that was featured on CNN. And they were really emboldened by this kind of um, media validation. They also felt their own power, and they provided a platform through which people could express their dissent. And it was from that moment on that things really shifted. And then I'll just tell one other story, which helps explain how people started to hack the heck out of governments and corporations, because uh, they were doing that a little bit, but then um, when they targeted an, a firm by the name of H.B. Gary, um, things really changed. And H.B. Gary was a kind of creepy um, security uh, corporation, and their CEO, Aaron Barr, claimed to have infiltrated Anonymous. And he had a name of operatives, key operatives. And he was gonna go to the FBI and, and other kind of um, security firms, or clients, not security firms, but corporate clients, and give over the name. Well, first of all, most of the names were wrong. And it was pretty <laughs> funny too, because he didn't even have the names of like the core hackers on this list. And actually many of those core hackers were hanging out on public channels, right? And they were clearly important people. Um, and so Anonymous decided that they should, you know, enact revenge against Aaron Barr and H.B. Gary. And so within kind of uh, eight hours of finding out, they ruthlessly hacked H.B. Gary. They downloaded 7,000 of company emails, posted them on the Pirate Bay. They deleted a bunch of files. They wiped out Aaron Barr's iPad and phone. They commandeered his Twitter account <laughs> and spewed a lot of, like, racist material. They kind of, like you know, embarrass the heck out of him. And this was pure revenge. You know, this was like, you are gonna give these names over and we have to kind of stop this and let other people know that don't do this. But in the course of this hack, they found extremely damning information in these emails where H.B. Gary, in conjunction with two other firms, Palantir and Barico, were proposing to Bank of America to discredit both WikiLeaks and journalists who supported WikiLeaks, like Glenn Greenwald. And so the idea was to smear them, to DDoS WikiLeaks, uh, to plant false information, um, basically to act as kind of agent provocateurs in different ways and discredit individuals, right? And so it was, it was really interesting. It was only a proposal, and obviously it was stopped short by this um, hack. But this kind of emboldened the hackers to kind of con continue in that vein um, where they more proactively sought to hack corporations and and governments to seek data that they can then leak. Mm. So I suppose you have this confluence of things like Anonymous becoming emboldened more public. You mentioned the Pirate Bay, obviously Pirate Party after that, WikiLeaks, LulzSec, and, and subsequently Snowden, and all, right. all of these things kind of coming together it must have got, I mean, obviously we know about a lot of nastiness and backstabbing and ratting out and all that kind of stuff. I mean, how would you kind of typify that moment in Anonymous's history? You know, it was it like a complete clusterfuck or were there people kind of mm -hmm. standing together or? Uh, it, it, at the moment, so at which moment in, in particular? At the mo when, when um, for example, just straight after that and also when the arrest started happening. So that's one of the fascinating things about uh, Anonymous is that, you know, on the one hand, like any political movement, there's a lot of drama and backstabbing, right? Like who, you know, which political movements don't have this? They kind of all do. I think there is something about, you know, the internet that sometimes heightens drama a little bit. But along with that, you also have, um, you know, serious uh, differences that, of opinion as to what's proper um, in many ways, but not a lot of effort to police. So people will will fight over tactics, but they won't necessarily try to stop each other over tactics, right? And there's also a lot of warring between different groups, and you know, certain groups have DDoSed each other, <laughs> you know? Um, 
DDoS is kind of gaming, right? Um, uh, an extreme sports. And then there's also the fact that, you know, while there, I think sometimes it's a little bit exaggerated how amorphous anonymous is. There are stable teams of people who work together. Nevertheless, there's not a lot of work put into kind of thinking through long-term organization. It's kind of remarkable that anything gets done. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's just like, wow, drama, lack of organization, you know, lazy hackers who get really obsessed about something. And, you know, next thing you know, they're hacking into all these different places. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why is, first of all, there's a kind of Wild West environment um, to this world. And it's just really fun. It was really addicting to be there, you know. And I couldn't unplug, and I think a lot of people couldn't unplug. And in fact, I'll give you one story which really captures this. And it's the fact that people were so into the kind of social world that kind of helps explain why they were there and they followed through. But one of the characters in this book is Sabu, who uh, was a very charismatic hacker, who also became an FBI informant. And he was flipped in 24 hours after the police showed up to the housing projects in New York City where he lived, and he started to work for the FBI. And he sought me out, and we met as well. I didn't know he was an informant. And you know, when I found out, when we all found out, we were all extremely angry. And in many ways, I still can understand why he flipped at some level. He was facing 128 years in jail. He had two foster kids, right? But what I cannot understand is this. In March, a kind of competing hacker group that hated anonymous backtrace security um, doxed, which is, you know, identified a number of people in anonymous. Now, again, most people were wrong on the, on the list but one was correct. It was Hector Monsegur Sabu. His, his last name was slightly misspelled. So there's this guy, he knows his name has been correctly identified, right? And he couldn't disappear right then because then it would be obvious, but why didn't he leave a month later, six weeks later? He could have gone dark, he could have wiped everything from his computer, and he wouldn't have been caught. So why then? I think it's because what he had, you know, this is what was meaningful in his life. Um, he did have a very difficult situation. He was unemployed. He was the father figure to two brothers, foster kids in a, a kind of family that many people had gone to jail because of drugs. Um, I just don't think he could detach and many people could not detach, right? And along with that, other people, for example, Jeremy Hammond, who was caught by Sabu, um, was also caught in part because he shared too much personal information about himself. And so he had very good technical security, but on some of the channels he mentioned that he had done prison time in federal prison. Okay, so here's a hacker by the name of Anarcho Chaos <laughs> who had done federal prison. There's one hacker in the United States who's an anarchist who had done time in federal prison, and that's Jeremy Hammond. Hmm. Had he not, first of all, used that name, he should not have used that name, but it was his identity had he not also revealed that he was um, in jail for a couple of years, perhaps he wouldn't have been caught or it would have at least taken a little bit longer. Do you think that in that case and also Sabu's case, there is a subconscious um, kernel of wanting to actually get caught? I mean, a lot of hackers haven't got caught. So I think, um, I, I, I can't really speak to their inner psychology. I, I do think that what is difficult is not being recognized for what you do and that there is a desire for people to know who you are and what you did. And that's the fascinating thing about Anonymous is that despite the fact that there's no general political ideology, there is one current that probably unites all the different eras, all the different networks, and it's the anti-celebrity ethic where you're not supposed to seek fame or recognition or name for what you do. And that means that people who are very kind of public about who they are um, are shamed and drugged and chastised and marginalized. And you know, many people who participate in Anonymous are not hackers, right? And so they could be public. And there are certain characters, most famously Barrett Brown, who kind of showed up to Anonymous with his name, and as a result, he was really drugged, you know? So between the fact that as a hacker, you do have to kind of hide who you are, and then you combine this anti-celebrity ethic, there's a lot of kind of pressure to engage in self-effacement, 
And I think that that is difficult over time for people. What do you think the social impact of Anonymous has been? Because in a way, I suppose you could join the dots of would WikiLeaks have happened in the same way? Um, would Edward Snowden, now the, you know, the clean cut official face of, of leaking, um, have, have gone and, and done what he done what he did? What do you think that, I mean, is that making a leap or what? Or? No, you know, you know, I've never talked to Snowden um, and I, I suspect he wouldn't be a huge fan of Anonymous. This is just me kind of pontificating. Julian Assange, on the other hand, really likes Anonymous. And actually, I, I even like confirmed this personally recently. Um, and it doesn't matter, though, whether Snowden or not likes Anonymous. What WikiLeaks, Anonymous, and Snowden have done is make sure a set of issues around privacy, anonymity, surveillance, they've ensured that this has been in the atmosphere nonstop for the last five, six years, right? And I'll never forget when WikiLeaks, you know, kind of imploded for all sorts of reasons, a lot of people's like, oh, that's so sad. You know, they've come to an end. And to me, I was like, no, they've, they've just started. You know, we're gonna really see many effects from WikiLeaks because people are gonna learn from them and follow in their footsteps. And I think Snowden absolutely learned from some of the mistakes of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. What is so important about Anonymous is that they're the grassroots face to many of the issues that you know lone whistleblowers are engaging in, right? Not everyone is going to kind of take on the NSA. <laughs> like that's a big, big organization and the GCHQ, right? And what's so interesting about Anonymous and so important is that it has helped constitute what I think of as the equivalent um, to the free speech movement, uh, which definitely, you know, took decades to come into being and really the apex happened in the 1960s with the free speech movement where a lot of students really, you know, jumped into this issue and transformed it from something that had been, you know, really niche into something much bigger. Anonymous, in a similar way, has taken issues around surveillance and privacy and transformed it from niche issues into a kind of social movement. So we have a kind of equivalence to the free speech movement with <coughs> privacy today, and Anonymous are kind of key actors or contributors to it. And if you could kind of distill one memory or one interaction that really resonated with you or that you, you feel was particularly extraordinary over your, over your time um, kind of working in, in this space, what would that be? I mean, it's so hard because there were, there were so many, you know, um, really interesting times because I spent both so much time initially at protests with people on the streets, but then it really shifted online. And, you know, it's hard to um, describe in a short way, you know, what it was like to be engaging in massive kind of protest uh, activities in the Arab Spring or in defense of WikiLeaks. Uh, but it was really exciting, you know, to have all sorts of people, you know, jumping in, discussing, uh, you know, acting in unison together, even though there was kind of a lot of difference of opinion. Um, I will say that I increasingly became very paranoid, you know, and that was something that was very tough, actually. You know, there was a moment I was like, this is so fun, this is great. Uh, but then basically as warrants were issued, people were arrested. I mean, I literally had this like recurring nightmare where I was sleeping on the couch and um, where I used to live in New York City, I had a metal door and then the FBI would pound on the metal door and I would wake up. And the funny thing is I'd often be sleeping on that couch and then I would just wake up. So I'd be doing the same thing in the dream as I was doing in real life, it was awful. Um, but I'll never forget the moment where I was most paranoid. Um, <laughs> And it was when Jeremy Hammond found me in December and uh, he was about to delete all the files on um, related to the Stratford Corporation. So he had infiltrated the system, he had downloaded the emails, he had transferred the emails, but he was about to delete their entire system. And he found me online, but he, this person went by a different name, I didn't know who it was. And the name was Ghost. And Ghost found me and said, in 20 minutes, I'm going to RMRF, which is a computer command for deletion, a major uh, security intelligence firm. 
And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering whether it was someone trying to entrap me. Uh, you know, so if I had said, you know, right on, brother, like, go for it. Next thing you know, my reputation's ruined because that's splattered everywhere or like it's conspiracy because I'm, you know, acting like a cheerleader <laughs> to a hacker or something. So all I said was, hum, okay. <laughs> like, that's all I said. <laughs> but literally my jaw was dropping, you know. And it was funny because it was around Christmas time and like the family was in the corner like thinking I'm just being rude. I, this is going to like prove to them that I wasn't just being rude. There was something interesting going on that whole time. But I was scared. I was really, really scared. And then... You know, fast forward a few months later, it was Sabu who was the informant. You know, Jeremy was like the authentic one. You go, wow, things, you can't always tell what things are in Anonymous. And later on, I asked Jeremy, I was like, in jail, why did you tell me that? You know, you really scared me. He's like, I was just really excited. I had to tell someone. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very, that, that moment was very intense for me. Um, before we take a couple of questions, there's just one other thing that I think is very pertinent um, that you wrote that w was um, from Rise Up. Uh, you said, what surveillance really is at its root is a highly effective form of social control. The knowledge of always being watched changes our behaviour and stifles dissent. Um, I think that's a really useful thing to, to think about. So, Gabrielle Coleman, thank you very much. Yeah. Couple of questions. If anybody has some questions, or yep. And um, Luke Harding, who uh, from the Guardian, who wrote the Snowden file, said that he often got spied on, and that his iPhone would just batter with rain, and then it switched on the mic remotely. Has anything like that ever happened to you? So yeah, I remember that with Lou, uh, with Harding, right? Sometimes he'd be writing, and like the text would just disappear in his word processor. And nothing kind of super funky happened with my computer. Um, <laughs> but definitely, you know, Sabu had uh, met with me. And I can't say 100% sure, but I'm almost sure he was sent to me by the FBI. And the reason why I think this is because, um, I mean, I think he had his own agenda as well. He wanted someone to meet him because he knew he was going to be exposed, actually, uh, because Fox News had found him basically, and that's the only reason why the FBI went public with his name as well. They would have kept him. They would have kept him working as an informant, right? But eventually a reporter found him. She went to the FBI. It was kind of game over. So I think he had his own agenda. But the, after we met for the first time, the very next day uh, we were chatting, maybe even that evening, and he asked me about a hacker who he'd never asked about before, uh, Jacob Applebaum, who's a um, tour developer, a well-respected journalist, hacker, who's now been living in self-exile in Berlin because he just does not feel comfortable being back in the United States because he's been harassed so many times at the border. And when he started <coughs> working with Glenn Greenwald and Laura Portress, he, he refused to go back. So Sabu, the day after we meet, goes, so... You know, I know you're friends with Jake. Uh, he's a good man. You know, tell him if he ever needs something from us, you know, we're here for him. And again, Sabu's working for the FBI at this point, right? This is not accidental. And it wasn't the only time he asked me about Jacob either, right? He was trying to get me to get Jacob to speak to Sabu, which is to speak to the FBI, right? So sure, you know, that was definitely going on. And um, to Una's quote as well. I mean, it was just really hard at a certain point during research thinking everything I write on this keyboard is, you know, even if I'm using encryption, if there's a key logger, that doesn't matter, right? And I still assume that's the case. And really, it sucks. You know, it's a huge violation. And it's really hard to think that, you know, people are tracking your every thought and move. And it does really constrain what you say and what you can do. I suppose also as well, it, you can't be paranoid enough in a way, like the, the most ludicrous things can happen and have happened. I mean, I was having a conversation last night with James Ball from The Guardian who worked kind of across the Snowden NSA stuff. Um, and he was kind of talking ab the, over for the web summit and he was kind of talking about how a senior UK official came to The Guardian office and was saying, we can't speak in this room because the empty cups and the laser will you know, come in. and 
you know, uh, monitor the conversation. And, and James was laughing about how ridiculous this is. The other person in the conversation with us last night was a guy called Stuart Baker, the former general counsel of the NSA, um, and worked on policy for the Department of Homeland Security underneath um, W. Bush. And Stuart's got a very serious guy, and he just goes, you think that was funny? <laughs> 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 it's, like, it's, it's terrifying, the ludicrousness. Yeah. Of, of what can actually be under surveillance. Absolutely. I mean, they, the, the resources that the NSA and GCHQ have at their disposal are enormous, you know? They're enormous. And it's certainly the case that, you know, it does seem like encryption does work. But, for example, my computer was bought online, right? Which is a terrible idea. The next computer I buy is going to be at a store, you know, with cash, right? <laughs> and then I'm going to assume it doesn't have a keylogger, right? Uh, anonymous is, by its nature, anonymous. Do you think that uh, the NSA or GCHQ or any kind of, or I'm sure there's hundreds of other similar organizations that we haven't heard of, do you think any of them have done stuff under the cover of the anonymous banner? Right, so that's a great question, right? Because we both know, not simply because you know, there's nothing special about Anonymous and the fact that it's online that makes them uh, more susceptible to infiltration because it happens offline as well. But w because it happens offline, we have to assume it happens online as well, right? And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why when Jeremy Hammond was deleting um, files, I was like, oh my God, this is an agent provocateur planted by the FBI who's... Uh, being so extreme to discredit Anonymous, right? And in this case, that wasn't uh, necessarily what happened, but one can imagine that that could happen. But we don't have any evidence of it. We do have evidence, though, of um, GCHQ DDoSing Anonymous. And that came out in the Snowden files. And that was a big deal. And that was a big deal for two reasons. First of all, a lot of what goes on on the chat channels is perfectly legitimate conversation, organizing. It's people exercising their free speech rights to associate, right? And so basically because there's a couple channels where there's illegal activity going on, they basically wipe out the whole server, right? And so this was a big deal. The worst thing was that, um, you know, one of the odd things is that there was this one fellow by the name of Chris Weatherhead, and he ran an IRC uh, network, a non-ops, and he had been arrested, and he was sentenced originally to 18 months for, conspiring, um, for conspiracy for DDoSing because he ran the IRC network. He ended up only doing about three or four months, but it was one of the longer sentences, even longer than some of the hackers. And... Um, I won't go into why, but it's because he wasn't remorseful and he didn't think he did anything wrong and he didn't plead guilty. Those who pled guilty to this got no time. He was really punished uh, to, because he went to trial. But when he found out that his own government had DDoSed him, basically, um, and yet he's the one that went to jail, you know, this is a double standard going on that's quite unfair. Yeah. Right, another question, if you don't mind. Um, does Ireland have an equivalent of something like GCHQ. Is, is, there, an, is there a part of the Irish government that monitors um, online traffic, do we know? G2? Oh, sure. <laughs> G2, but it's only targeted. They only monitor people when they enter the one. Yeah, I mean, I think what was interesting about when you were talking about the Irish, uh, the, the hacker trial, um, I would imagine that the, a lot of the leniency um, or kind of ignorance towards those kind of things are, are based on a lack of sophistication within our intelligence services. Now that might be a complete, <laughs> I'm just hypothesizing, yeah. but you know, I'm not sure how many special branch or Gardaí are incredibly up on this kind of stuff in the yeah. same way the that GC. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like in the same way that you see HK, I don't think you can make a, a comparison. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because some people ask, well, what's going on with Anonymous today? And there's different ways to answer. But Latin American hacker groups have never stopped. They're on fire. LulzSec Peru has, like, continuously hacked the Peruvian government and gotten really interesting emails. There's one very big AP story. It's called, you know, 
Uh, AP is now doing investigative journalism, and they have an in-depth story about them. And one of my theories is that a lot of these Latin American countries don't have the kind of cyber crime units necessary to go uh, after these hackers. So if you're in this sort of into this sort of activity, I mean, go to Latin America. Yeah. That's really what you should do, and it's really fun fun place to live on top of it, and affordable, like a hacker haven, basically. Good, good food, great food, yeah. <laughs> and it's funny too because, um, and in Brazil in particular is also a hotbed of activity. 4chan was very popular, there's a lot of hackers, there's a big tech scene, there's a huge open source scene, right? Um, and also there's you know a lot of kind of uh, Brazilian humor and trickery that's part of the culture. And so you could imagine like uh, a culture that already embraces trickery and humor meeting an internet culture that loves trickery and humor and it is probably like <laughs> tricksterism and humor on steroids down there. So I would love if a grad student ever worked in that area, um, so. Just maybe one more question, or a couple more? Okay, cool. Uh, yep. How many times have you changed your password in the last few years? <laughs> <laughs> Every day. <laughs> I do change them a lot, you know. Um, I probably don't change them enough in, in many ways, but I do change them a lot. And it's, 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 it's really difficult. And that's the other thing, you know, operational security is a practice that has to be constantly enacted. And I'm, I am amazed by the hackers who have participated in Anonymous and have never been caught. Um, and in some ways, you know, one thing I didn't do uh, that I would have liked to do is kind of just interview them about what they have done over the years to cultivate this practice to ensure that they don't get caught. Because for every person that got caught, there's another one who didn't. Yep. I um, just wanted to ask you about, you mentioned in the book about Mark Bunker. And I just wanted to know that Mark Bunker was the one, if anybody doesn't know, and he's called Wisebeard Man because he said to everybody, listen, it's all great and it's all brilliant that you're attacking Scientology, but we're going to get blamed for it. So why not do legal things? Why not, you know, don't go into church and Scientology and stuff, rubber gloves down the toilet, yeah. protest, you know, legally and do all that. Were you surprised that there wasn't a big, you know, like I can backlash against Mark Bunker? He's very still, even to this day, although people give out about him, but most people still respect him. Yeah. So this is great because really I can't tell you, I mean, for those, a lot, I, a lot of people here do know a bit about this world. But for those who don't, you know, Anonymous could be a very playful thing, but it could be a very fearsome thing, you know. And just recently someone tweeted at me. Like they were mad at me. Anonymous was never supposed to be political. It was never supposed to be political. Really pissed. And I, I agree. I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. It was like fearsome internet trolling. Um, and when they were trolling the Church of Scientology, a couple things came together to help them kind of leapfrog into activism. One was a video that Anonymous published that was very compelling, that declared war against the Church of Scientology. It was done as a joke, but people started to debate. Then there was this wise beard man. Um, who was a critic of Scientology and had been protesting and kind of pleaded uh, to these troll tricksters saying, can you guys simmer down, simmer down, join the cause, stop DDoSing, stop hacking. Um, and like people listened, right? And I think again, there's many ways or many things that fed into that kind of transformation, one of which is Scientology is this perfect target, you know, like once you start learning about them, you're like, you are a mini example of totalitarianism, right? And you're a bit more contained than, you know, fighting the GCHQ or British government. Like Scientology is a formidable kind of um, enemy, but still a more contained one. Um, and then I think, you know, the video was very compelling as well. And the fact that he made it as a video also really mattered because in this era, there was a lot of videos being made, and it, and so he kind of reached out to their, you know, using their genre and their format, um, and I think that also kind of appealed. But it was also the video, it was also that, you know, the moment was ripe, and then also I think, you know, a big thing was the first street protests, um, which were on February 10th, 2008. And I think in, I went to the one in New York, and certainly a case that a lot of people just simply wanted to meet other people from 4chan, which is far more anonymous. So they're like, oh, finally we meet people from our culture, you know? <laughs> Here we are on the streets, and many left, but many kind of stayed, because it's true, once you learn about Scientology, you're like, wow, that is just so creepy, 
you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was an Im- important kind of contributor, but I think the other kind of elements also just helped make sure that, yeah, they didn't just start to troll, you know, wise beard man. Do you like Vendetta? Do I? Oh, I love the movie. I love it. And actually, I think this is really important because one of the interesting things about Anonymous, kind of from an aesthetic political perspective, is that there's technical vanguardism, but there's aesthetic populism. This is a very, you know, Hollywood symbol, right, that anyone around the world can recognize, and they've made it into a kind of countercultural symbol. Um, and even though, you know, uh, Time Warner makes a little bit of money whenever someone buys a mask. Nevertheless, I think it's more powerful that the that the symbol is more identified with politics, right? Yeah. And I think the Hollywood movie is one of those rare Hollywood movies that are truly radical and truly political, where people watch it and, you know, that sends shivers down their spine. And Jeremy Hammond, so one of the great stories that I got um, that's in this book was that um, when I interviewed him in prison, he said, you know, one of my first website defacements, which was before Anonymous as a political entity existed, um, he left the Guy Fox mask uh, as an image on the defacement. So that he kind of already was using this symbol for his activity before Anonymous came into existence. And why did he do this? Well, V for Vendetta, the movie had come out a month earlier, and he adored it in a lot of kind of... Um, left-leaning anarchists love the movie. A lot of libertarians love the movie. But the movie's great because it really shows, you know, a kind of future that is possible in our own society. And then there's also that kind of beauty of interacting with another human, not based on what they look like, but on what they say. And I think the movie captures that really, really well. And one of the very nice things about interacting with people anonymously online is that you do get experience that kind of interaction where what matters is what people say and, and not where they're from and, and what they look like. Remember, remember. Yep. <laughs> it's assuming that what they say is not itself a deception, though. Uh, very true. You don't always know if things are true or not, but there's also a pleasure in deception and illusion and playing as well, right? And this is why I really like the, the metaphor of the maze, which is, on the one hand, being in a maze is really fun. It's a puzzle and... You know, you're trying to get in and out. And it can be also incredibly frustrating, right, and scary at times. So it is a kind of um, a double-edged sword. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations that happen online. And, you know, even if maybe someone is sharing something intimate, maybe it, it's not true. But nevertheless, the effect on you, if you're receiving that information, it doesn't matter whether it really happened or not, right? So. You still the back there? Yeah, with all the um, attacks you've had on yourself. Oh, I can't hear you. Um, with all the attacks you've had on yourself, what drove you to keep doing this uh, project that you followed and turned into a book? I, I couldn't hear. With all the kind of attacks on yourself, what um, drove you to follow through this as a project? Well, the project? Oh, well, first of all, there weren't um, a huge number of attacks. Maybe there will be <laughs> now, uh, now that I've published a book. <laughs> um, but. But there were, I mean, there were attacks, there were scary moments, right? And I think it was, first of all, that thrill of trying to figure out a puzzle um, that kept me there. Then I also do, was motivated by the fact that, and I still think this is the case, like, a lot of times people are like, well, Anonymous, um, they're just hellraisers who are using the cover of activism, but really, in fact, um, they're just hooblins, you know? And I, I actually don't think that's true. You know, I really don't think that's true, at least not based on the people I've met and I interacted. So there was a kind of like moral imperative to try to write a book that kind of gave a different picture from what people believed um, at some, some level. That's another one. Um, and then, yeah, I felt like the other really interesting thing about Anonymous is that if you're not there, if people are not there, um, the history becomes lost, right? So, for example, with Lulsec Peru and Latin America, it's really cool, like, all this stuff is going on, but no one's documenting it, and it's going to be, like, a hidden history. And I think that it's, there's really a lot of value not having everything represented, but I think it's really important to represent things for future generations, because even if Anonymous does not um, stay with us, I think either it's spirit or something 
similar but different will come into being, but you need some sort of archive to kind of help. And Anonymous has its own archives for that, videos, images, why we protest forum, amazing. But I also wanted to contribute some to that archive as well, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Well, I think that's a good note to finish on with one more question. <laughs> so you guys are going to join at the end. Um, well, just, just to get a sense from your own opinion, looking at the sort of the, the level and ferocity of, of state response uh, to particular activists, but also the wider milieu, do you, is it your sense that there's actually a, a deliberate attempt to squash a movement, a political movement, rather than challenge particular acts themselves? Absolutely. You know, I think that these things are inseparable, right? Um, but it's not simply the threat of one individual, right? Um, even though one individual certainly matters, is a gain, it makes the FBI look good. But I think that something like Anonymous, which came out of the blue, which tapped into the zeitgeist and also um, propelled it forward, which was so appealing to geeks and hackers who have a lot of technical skills and thus power, I think it was really important to try to squash it, you know? And there was one moment that was very fascinating, and it was this. Uh, in 2012, the left-leaning Polish political party took the Guy Fox mask, and um, they had a kind of paper cut version, and they used it when they were protesting a copyright act, uh, ACTA. And they, you know, they weren't claiming they were anonymous, but nevertheless, they took the anonymous symbol to protest um, a copyright treaty. And at that moment, it was like, okay, this symbol is now identified with activism, popular dissent. Guess what happened a few weeks later? The Wall Street Journal publishes basically what I think of as fake news uh, because they have an article which claims that um, the NSA claimed that Anonymous has the capability to take down critical infrastructure. Has, what does that mean to have the capability, right? Um, it was pure, I mean, the way I read it was that it was propaganda in reaction to the fact that government officials are taking this symbol and they lost the battle. They lost the battle. Here they were trying to kind of frame it in terms of terrorism, cyber war, but I don't think that frame has stuck. Um, and that's also part of the reason why they have to go after the hackers so um, ferociously because they set examples and say, well, okay, you know, you're clearly going to inspire others, but do you want to spend 10 years in jail for what you do, right? So I do think it's systematic. I think people that work in these organizations are very smart, um, and they think through political and social movements very, very carefully. One more, and then we're going to pause. Yeah, polarizing question here. <laughs> what is something you believe in that your peer group does not? Who's my peer group? Who's my peer group? <laughs> anonymous, or like, what sorts of you believe that anonymous? Well, I I definitely was very unhappy when anonymous violated people's privacy, you know, and I was kind of like very disappointed when that happened. So, for example, with Bay Area Rapid Transit, there was an operation um, in uh, against the censorship that uh, Bay Area Rapid Transit is the transportation system for San Francisco and they were going to shut off cell phone access to try to stop local protests against police brutality. And Anonymous got really involved. It was a great operation. But a hacker went ahead and, and dumped uh, personal customer data. You know, and I was like, that's kind of useless, right? Um, yes, they got on CNN as a result, and that's part of their calculation. But I think, you know, that both, you know, can damage the movement and it's unfair for the people whose data was dumped, right? And I kind of mentioned that in the book. So there's a few moments here and there definitely with what they do, I disagree. And But I, on the other hand, I get really frustrated. There's some journalist who shall remain unnamed who's just like, anonymous is bad because these things happen. And it's certainly the case that one can, you know, write off the entire movement because you can point to a couple of problems or mistakes, but I think that, um, you know, part of the power of Anonymous is its experimental nature where anyone can take the name, so very interesting things happen, and it allows for just very unusual types of people to kind of come together. There is going to be, at times, some kind of collateral damage as a result, and it's important to think of the ways that they and others can minimize it, but it's certainly the case that I don't agree with everything that kind of happens uh, within, within the entity. But in the end, I decided that, you know, it's something that I fall more in favor of. Um, 
But I also hope, you know, by showcasing some of their mistakes, others can both, you know, decide what they think and perhaps others can also learn from it and, you know, reinvent Anonymous in new and interesting ways. Gabriela, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. We recorded that. Oh, there.